All right, good morning, church. Man, I miss you all. I wish I could see your faces, hear the crowd. Uh, that would have been awesome. But, um, you know, here we are, uh, making the most of this opportunity that the Lord has given us to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, it is Resurrection Sunday, you know, and I ain't got no suit on. <laughs> and my hair ain't taken care of. All right, this is quarantine life right now. Um, so no Barbara, uh, but you know what? Our Sunday best is not about what we wear, it's about what we do. And we're worshiping God and we're remembering his resurrection uh, today. And uh, what we plan to do as a church this Sunday is that uh, me, Johnny and Kai are gonna be sharing three different components uh, of, about our resurrected savior and uh, pertaining to his life, his death, and his resurrection. I'm gonna be talking about his life. And so what I would like to do is to share two lessons that we could extract from the life of Jesus that we could actually use to really help us through these times that we're dealing with right now. The first point that I wanna share is that Jesus was focused on his mission and purpose. And because of his intense focus, uh, he didn't let anything detour him from his mission. You know, in Matthew 16, we get an encounter, uh, we get to see an encounter between Jesus and Peter. And, you know, Jesus is talking about, you know, what he came here to do and his mission and his purpose and what's gonna happen uh, and how he's gonna ultimately die, but then be resurrected. Uh, and Peter hears this and is very concerned about this. And he, he pulls you aside and rebukes Jesus, says, this will never happen to you. Uh, what are you talking about? And Jesus turns around, looks at Peter, and in verse, you know, Matthew 16, verse 23, Jesus says, Jesus turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And this is deep because he's challenging what Peter is concerned about. Even in the midst of hearing that statement, he's like, this is what you're concerned about, but you're not even thinking about what God is concerned about. And right now, for me, my priority are godly concerns. I don't have time to get caught up in these worldly concerns. And sometimes you got to ask yourself, okay, wow, that was a tough response, Jesus. He's just trying to look out for you. He loves you. He cares about you. Uh, why did he respond like that? And I think for us to understand why Jesus would respond like that, I think Jesus understood clearly that he was operating under enemy territory, that the, the territory that he was in was not this, this is not his home. And he realized that he wasn't trying to get comfortable here. See, unlike us, we get real comfortable thinking that this place is our home uh, and we get distracted from really focusing on the concerns of God. We get caught up here on earth, the concerns that we find here on earth, the concerns that we have here around us. That's our priority, right? These are the things that we prioritize. And God, Jesus is like, I don't got time for that. He understood clearly he's operating on enemy territory. And he never had that luxury. Uh, even from birth, when he came into this world, uh, it was in conflict. You know, Jesus' life begins with a genocide, right? The massacre of the innocents, where King Herod attempted to murder Jesus by ordering a systemic execution of all young boys within Bethlehem. And so this is where he came into earth. And then during his, 30, his three years of ministry, he was pretty much being pursued and hunted by the religious leaders and King Herod still, right? Like, so the religious leaders were hunting him down, wanting to kill him. This was his life. He didn't have time to get comfortable uh, and to get caught up in the concerns, earthly concerns. He was focused on his divine mission, his ultimate goal here on earth. And he didn't get distracted. And so part of being able to understand Jesus' mindset towards this, you got to understand the context in which he was born and raised in. And it wasn't comfortable. And the reason that I want to make a point about this is because Jesus understood that he didn't have time to play. Jesus understood that he had to make the most of every opportunity. Jesus understood that the moments are not worth wasting. He valued time, he valued intentions, and he valued life. And he was so serious about saving it. 
And these were his priorities. God's call, God's mission, and God's people really trying to restore this earth, not getting comfortable within it. So when it came down to it, Jesus was serious about taking care of business. You know, Luke 13 reads, verse 31, it says, At that time, some of the Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, probably Nicodemus looking out for Jesus, said to him, leave this place and go somewhere else because Herod wants to kill you. And then Jesus' reply shows a lot of his melanin in him because he replies and says, go tell that fox that I will keep driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I will reach my goal. Jesus was not intimidated. He was not deterred. He was focused on accomplishing his task, no matter what, whether it was friend trying to distract him or whether it was foe trying to distract him. He was focused on his mission and he didn't let anything pull him away. My question, disciples, is what about you? What about you? What about us right now? The wind's blowing, there's stuff going on. And you know, and I share with the men about don't get distracted focusing on the wind, but really keeping our eyes, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Are we focused on the goal that he called us to live out and the mission he called us to accomplish? How serious are you about the concerns of God? Where are your fierce intentions on full display? Is it for the concerns of God and building his kingdom? Or is it about the concerns of man and preserving your kingdom, right? We have to ask ourselves these questions consistently as disciples. Are we concerned about the concerns of God? Or are we concerned about the concerns of man and trying to preserve our kingdom, trying to preserve our entitlement that we believe to security, safety, and comfortability? Right? We got to challenge ourselves on these things on a consistent basis. You know, we could get real fierce when we feel our comfort, our security, and our stability is at risk. Right? We get real fierce about that, but then we could be very passive when it comes to the things of God and the concerns of God. That's when we say, oh, I need to be wise. You know, we need to be cautious. And, and we got to really, like, stop playing right now. This is not the time for it. If, if anything, this is the time for us as disciples to stop playing. People are scared. These times are tough. But you got to remember, you've been through things before. This isn't your first time dealing with trials and tribulations, unexpected circumstances. We all have a story that preceded this virus. We've all had trials that preceded this virus. And guess what? You're still here. We have to find solace in that. Our past shapes our context and the way that we see this world. Jesus was serious because he was born into the conflict. He saw what was going on. He didn't have time to play. We got to see that for ourselves. We don't have time to play. Things are serious. This is bad, but this ain't the worst thing, nor will it be the last thing you'll ever go through and will ever go through as a church. Don't lose sight on the goal. You still have a calling. You still have a mission. Yes, it's a pandemic, but the mission is still the same. Yes, we are losing people, but the purpose has not changed and we can't lose sight of this. We have a mission and calling, just like Jesus did. It's not a time to shrink back, nor is it a time to lose sight. This is a time to let your light shine. During these times, we have to ask ourselves, even when we feel like our options are limited to let, light, let our light shine and to add to this world, we gotta really figure out what can I do? If you're blessed to have what you need right now during these times, I really wanna challenge you to make sure you're turning around and looking for ways to support those who don't. To really, how can I help out my neighbor or my family member or this brother and sister here in this family? What can I, can I send them food? Can I help them out with this? Look for those things. You could still be a light. We have these opportunities. How can you can encourage someone? You know, when resources are limited, prayer is more than enough. When resources are limited, prayer is more than enough. And we have to make sure we're lifting up people in prayer. We have to lift up our leaders more than we're complaining about them. And I'm talking about the government to even, even spiritual leaders, like leaders, period. Even your corporate leaders at your job. Pray for them more than you're complaining about them. Not saying you ain't got nothing to complain about. But what I am saying is, Prayer is essential, that's our number one tool. And I know woke people like to walk around and say, all the church likes to do is prayer, but they, those woke people need to go to sleep because prayer is our number one tool. 
Don't let anyone tell you different. That's what God has given us to do something great in this world. And it helps keep our minds centered around God's concerns when it comes to these matters and not just getting caught up in uh, man's concerns when it comes to these things. So it's essential that we're praying. My second and final point is this. Jesus wasn't afraid to show emotion. Jesus was not afraid to show emotions. Man, for me, when I started studying the Bible, this was a game changer for me because uh, the first study we did was the cross study. In this study, you know, you see Jesus, you know, the brother who shared it with me started off with Matthew 26, where Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane. In this, I saw Jesus crying. I saw him afraid. I saw him sweating blood because he was so concerned. And it, this kind of like blew my mind. And the brother asked me this question, does this sound like a man or like God to you? And when he asked me that, I had to step back. I was like, this sounds like a man. And then he said, I'm going to show you how you, a man, could become a Christian. And I love that because what he did through that study was connect Jesus' humanity to his divinity. And then showed how I could live that life out too. Even in the midst of my humanity and my insecurities and my fears and my concerns, that I could still walk the walk that Jesus walked on earth. And that's so important for us to understand that. Jesus was not afraid to show his emotions. When his friend Lazarus died, when his friend Lazarus died, he, you know, the family was sad. They were concerned. They came to Jesus. Where were you at? Why weren't you here? You could help this. And Jesus turned around and was like, guys, believe in me, right? You know, I, he's okay. I got this. It'll be fine. You believe in me, right? And they're like, yes. And then when Jesus walked in and he saw how sad everyone was, the sisters, the family, the friends around, it gives one of the most powerful verses in the Bible. Jesus knew that things were going to be okay. Jesus knew that a miracle was going to happen. Jesus knew that there was going to be a resurrection. Yet and still, John eleven thirty five 35 says, Jesus wept. And when, he, when it says wept, it didn't say he cried. It means he wept. Like out of his soul, he was hurting for what he saw and what the, the loss that they are experiencing at that time. And I wanted to bring this up because he was moved to tears. He was crying with them. He felt their pain. And he himself was hurting because they were hurting. And when Jesus is here doing this, this is not a sign of faithlessness. This is not a sign of doubt, right? This is a sign of him basically, really, it's a sign of empathy, a sign of sympathy. It's a sign of vulnerability. We see our risen savior as a vulnerable, humble, sympathetic, empathetic servant to the people. This is a sign of someone who is concerned and connected with the circumstances at a human level. Religion teaches us to be real robotic in our approach towards life. And the danger with religion is that we could become enslaved to rules instead of a ruler. And in religion, there's a one size fits all perspective or approach towards all these things. And that itself could be very inhumane. Crying during this time is not a lack of faith. Being hurt during this time is not you doubting God. Being sad is not you saying God does not exist. Sometimes we need to take a moment. This is tough for all of us. It's not easy. And we see that clearly in Jesus' life. And what's so powerful about that scripture is it connects us to his humanity. Jesus was fully human and he felt pain and was sad and was hurt. I'll end with this scripture. It says in Hebrews 4.15, it says, Now that we know that we have Jesus, this great high priest with ready access to God, let us not slip through, let, let's not let it slip through our fingers. We don't have a priest who is out of touch with our reality. He's been through weakness and testing, experienced it all but sin. So let's walk right up to him and get what he is so ready to give. Take mercy and accept the help. That's Hebrews 4.15 in the message version. Accept the help. Talk to people. During this time of social distancing, do not become emotionally distant. Please, right? It's okay to be real. And I want to challenge people, man especially like our families, spouses talk to each other. Have some pillow talk where you're vulnerable with one another, keeping it real with where you're at and praying for each other. Understand that, you know, being strong for your family 
uh, is not what God's calling you to be right now. It's not about being strong for your family. It's about being spiritual for your family. And being spiritual is not hiding your emotions, but showing how to go to God with your emotions. And that's what's important. You know, my best friend lost his father and I was hurting and my son saw this and I was like, man, he was like, you know, I was like, he's like, what's wrong? And I'm like, I'm just sad because of, you know, Uncle Corey lost his dad and I got to pray for him, you know? And then the next day my son came to me and was like, daddy, are you okay? I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, I prayed for Uncle Corey and Uncle Wanda. And I was like, man, that is something I never saw growing up. I saw being strong as you were pressing and you suppressing your emotions, but not, I didn't know where to go with them and how to deal with it. We need to make sure we're setting spiritual examples. For those who aren't married and are single and at home alone, I, for those who are with people, reach out. Be a support and encouragement to them. And for those who are single and by yourself, I pray that you're connecting with someone and you're connecting with spiritual people that are gonna encourage you with the word of God in prayer, not encourage you to run to a vice or with some uh, worldly logic. Let's stay connected. It's okay to feel. It's actually very godly. We see that in Jesus. But don't forget that you are called to be on mission. And though options may seem limited, we need to go to God in prayer and ask, how can I be alive? God, show me who I could serve during this time and how I could serve. Use your creativity that the Lord has given you. Lean on the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of you. And let's let this Resurrection Sunday not just be a resurrection of the risen Lord who rose, but a resurrection of the church that gets up, sees what God is calling us to do, and goes aggressively and undistractedly towards the goal of heaven. We thank you, and I pray all this in Jesus' name that we can see great victory. Amen.